Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basements. On today's video, before we get started, I'm just gonna talk about the fact that my voice sounds a little bit weird, and that's because I, unfortunately, am getting over human malware. Yeah, it finally got me after all these years, and it hasn't been a fun time, but I'm doing much better, as you could tell, as I'm up and trying to make a video here, and we'll see how this goes. <laughs> I might be sweating a little bit weirdly, or coughing or whatever, but, uh, yeah, I think this should hopefully go all right. We'll see, actually, if this video gets released on time. Anyhow, for this video, what was going on maybe about, I don't know, a couple months ago, I happened to be browsing AliExpress, as one does, and I found something that I thought was really interesting, and I ordered it. And in this video, I'm gonna try to get that thing working, and I have no idea if it is gonna work or this is gonna be a successful video, but whether it is or isn't, <laughs> I'll release it anyways. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Well, I know I was a little cryptic in the intro talking about what I found, but this is it right here. I was searching around and I'd seen these in the past, but it said it was a brand new CRT or television board, the circuitry that goes inside of your TV set. And actually what I paid for it was $47, including shipping. So the price has gone up a little bit since I got this. Let's take a quick look at this listing here. Obviously only four sold, which probably when I bought it, there was three sold. So I took a little bit of a gamble there, but I figured, you know, if it didn't work out, I try to get my money back. 14 to 21 inch CRT motherboard, high definition digital color TV driver board. And there it is. It looks like a TV board. And it's got a flyback, it has all the electronics, it has a tuner on there. It looks like it included a power cord and, uh, and a remote control. And let's look at these other pictures here. It's got some uh, video input connectors there. And uh, there is like a front input jack along with a little control board for the little buttons that would go on the front of the TV. A couple different angles of it, not much to report there. Uh, let's keep going. Okay, and then here we go. Look at this. A schematic. Okay, so that's actually really helpful because I kind of wondered with this board, how exactly can this work? Like, how could it be so universal, so to speak? But the schematic is helpful because in case we need to make some changes or whatever to make this work on a television that I happen to have in stock that we can try connecting this up to, well, that goes a long way. Now, you might be wondering, why exactly did I go ahead and order this in the first place? Like, I have TVs that work. What does it matter? Well, the reason why is because, A, it's fascinating that there's a board like this that's made in 2023 for televisions. Like, really? <laughs> so that's weird, A. And then B, this is going to be a PAL television uh, because obviously this is for the Chinese market, probably, I guess, or probably somewhere else in Asia. And that's most likely going to be a PAL market device. Now, I don't have any PAL televisions, especially CRT TVs, that has a tuner input specifically. Now, I have a bunch of computers like the BBC Micro and Commodore 64s and stuff from PAL markets that output a PAL RF signal but I have no way to tune those in here in North America. So I thought if I order this and I can get this thing working, well, maybe, maybe then I can try connecting up one of those old computers to it and actually have a way to display a true PAL RF signal. Uh, one last picture here, take a look at this. There's a box, <laughs> international quality. <laughs> why, is it, <laughs> why is it pixelated? <laughs> That's, that is just hilarious. Anyhow, so yeah, I went ahead, I clicked order, and I don't know, some weeks passed, and it arrived. And here it is. This is the box right here. Uh, digital main board of TV. Unfortunately, the pixelated lady, nowhere to be found. There's just this like wet shower mark or whatever <laughs> this is right here. Like, would that be on a shower curtain or whatever? Let's take a closer look at the box here. Picture Master HD, digital main board of television. And right here along the bottom, it says work ath Hong Shung product with the care and precision of a sculptor in each step. Wonderful have no limits. <laughs> I love it. Maybe that's what it says here in Chinese, or maybe that just says digital main board of TV. 
And then on this side of the box here, we have some writing that is um, in Chinese, but we can decode it because on the other side of the box, it's in English, luckily. It does have the name of the company that made it here. I'm not gonna butcher the pronunciation, but if you wanna check out this website here, uh, well, feel free. Maybe there's some interesting information there and you can let me know. But on the other side of the box here actually is in English. So it adopts the Toshiba 8873, plus lists some other chips here and a super single IC. Well, I happen to know for sure that the IC that's on here is uh, this one right here. It's actually a Toshiba part. So I don't know, maybe it can be specced out with a whole bunch of these different ICs. It says here that it can work on 14 to 29 inch kinescopes. Kinescope is a, another term for CRT itself. It talks about 50 or 60 Hertz, widescreen support, does say that it supports PAL and NTSC. It says TSC, but NTSC obviously is what it means. 3.58 plus NTSC 4.43, CCAM optional. Well, hopefully it supports at least PAL and NTSC uh, 3.58. Talks about language support here, Chinese, English, and Vietnamese for the on-screen displays. And everything else on here, it's pretty run of the mill. And right here is what actually came inside the box. So we have a remote control. We do have the schematic that it kind of showed in that photograph, and I did scan this in. And then we have the main board itself. What is missing, unfortunately, is the power cord, which is kind of annoying because uh, the power cord would connect either right here or right here, and I'm gonna have to figure out a way to connect that up. I don't have a power cord to connect up. So look, looking at this here, yeah, like we have exactly what was described. This is a CRT neck board, which you notice there's a little notch cut out right here. That is where the original board was and then it kind of they break it out it's a way to save on manufacturing costs we have the flyback transformer right here which uh, is definitely brand new and unused in fact there is a date code on there let me see if i can uh, get this to show up there 2023 <laughs> march 10th that's how recent this thing was made isn't that amazing <laughs> we have a wiring harness thing going on here and it looks like there are some that are not connected to anything i'm pretty sure those are for speakers right and left speakers would connect up right here this will be the audio amplifier pretty sure this is going to be mono even though there are two speaker outputs there's just one audio amplifier chip there it just has three pins so that's a little bit of a of a fakery going on we have a front AV input right here on a little board. We have the IR receiver. Obviously this is the little control board and just got two wires. So it uses resistors. And this right here is the main IC and it's that Toshiba part I talked about. And then on the back of the set right here, we have AV inputs and probably an output. And we have the tuner here. Notice the connector is a little different than we're used to in North America here. The rest of the world, you're gonna think that's pretty normal and that's because it is for you. So that's definitely a PAL tuner of some kind. Now looking at this board, all looks pretty run of the mill. This is very much like um, a late model television set. Everything is as simplified as possible. This one IC does everything. All the on-screen displays, the microcontroller, all the chroma processing, everything like that is handled by this IC. There's gonna be some deflection going on right here. We have horizontal deflection, that's the larger chip. And then this is gonna be the vertical, the smaller one right there. As I said, this is the audio amplifier right there. And then this IC right here has to do with the power supply, the switch mode power supply that powers up this entire board. And speaking of that, this large filter cap capacitor here is no longer connected to the board anymore. Now flipping this over, it just appears that we have broken solder joints right there. So nothing is damaged, just came off in shipping, I guess. There's just not a whole lot to talk about here other than this just looks like a late model CRT board that would be similar to any CRT board you might find in any TV that's made in the 2000s. In the early 2000s, they were pretty much looking like this, and this looks the same. I have to ask the question, this thing is definitely made in, well, 2023, and why? Is it a replacement for some existing TVs that were out there, like this is uh, in case you have a, a failure? Or is this something that exists to build new CRTs? I think it might actually be for new CRTs. And the reason why I say that is because I was looking around on Alibaba, and this was after a tip from a viewer. It seems that there are companies that are still making and selling CRTs, at least in China. I'm not totally sure of which market, like which country in the world is buying up any CRTs in 2023, but 
it just appears they're still being made. And from the pictures I saw online of these TVs, the board looks exactly the same. They didn't have interior shots of these TVs, but they could see the ports and stuff that popped through with the tuner and the uh, AV jacks and also the front panel with you know the, the, the jacks on the front and it all matches. So I'm sure it's using this particular board right here. Now, pulling this apart a little bit, looks like we have some wires right here. These are for deflection yoke. Uh, looks like over here by the flyback, there are what well, we have five different jacks we can plug this into, and that's probably for some amount of universality. universality. Uh, that, that word is completely made up. It's probably to help tune the fact that the flexion yokes on the CRT are slightly different one from another. And the horizontal one specifically is a very important, you know, needs to be tuned. So I wouldn't be surprised if we might have to move this around when we hook this up to an actual CRT. To get this working, we're obviously going to need a television set, so something with a CRT and a deflection yoke, since that's not included here. So this thing should theoretically just work. I mean, I guess. I have no experience here. This is like operating completely blind. One other thing to consider is the power supply, the switch mode power supply on this thing is surely designed for 220 volts and may not be multi-voltage capable. If the box doesn't say anything about 120 volts, and looking at the schematic here, the power input, which is right here, it just says 220 volts, 50 hertz. But that just could be saying, well, it doesn't really mean anything, to be honest. So this may work at 120 volts, but it may not. I can convert this by taking this cap out, putting two caps, and running an extra wire jumper link between the bridge rectifier and the middle of those two caps to convert it to operate on 120 volts, you know, without any problem at all. But I think in light of that right now, just for testing at least, I will be running this off a step up transformer, which I have, and that way we'll eliminate any potential issues with the voltage, and then I can worry about that at some point in the future. Of course, the very first thing I do need to worry about is the fact that this cap is falling out of the board. So I'm just going to fix this problem that happened in transport or whatever by resoldering this cap on. Generally for something like this, you would have installed little eyelets on the leads that just sort of help it, well, prevent this kind of thing from happening. And uh, well, that costs a little bit of extra money and they didn't even bother with that. All right, so with that done, cap is, it's in there. Look, it wobbles a little bit. It probably should have some like hot glue or something put around the bottom if this thing does end up working. Although I'm not gonna be shipping it, so it doesn't really matter. This is the TV that's gonna be the guinea pig for this experiment. It's a Magnavox, which is a, a Philips, a North American Philips. It's a junk TV, to be honest. I bought this at a thrift store for a few bucks years ago. In fact, it's just been stored up in my garage. It has fine picture quality, it's nothing really to complain about, but this TV was made around 2004. And if we flip this around, I already have the cover off. It's a very similar TV, to be honest, uh, the board design to the one that we were just looking at. Even though this is from 2004, it's a small PCB. It's a single chip design. It has a Philips chip on it as opposed to the Toshiba. That's it really. Um, the CRT here is not from Philips or Magnavox, it's from Chung Hua. I'm not totally sure of that manufacturer, but obviously very end of the CRT game. Not a lot of companies were even making CRTs. It does say it was made in Malaysia right here. Uh, but yeah, this would be a very, very inexpensive TV and I don't know, not much to report. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the lineage of the board we were just looking at, the one I just got, is very similar to this. Like the design is probably gonna be nearly the same as this board. Now, one thing that is for sure is that if this does work, well, that board I just got, it's not gonna fit inside this case. This has uh, front inputs as well, but this is part of the PCB itself and you know, yada, yada, yada. So if this does work, it will require some kind of a, a custom case maybe or something. I don't know if I wanna try to turn this into something that's like a real working CRT. Anyhow, let's power this thing off and I'm gonna take this thing apart We'll take a closer look at this board here and just see how many similarities do exist here. One thing I wanted to do before totally taking this apart, and I know you can't see it very clearly, but I wanted to check the operating voltage of the CRT, and it is around 20,000 volts on this set. Now, I don't have to remind anyone that working inside a CRT is very, very dangerous. Open power supplies of any kind, to be honest, are very dangerous, but a CRT 
is dangerous as well because I just said there's 20,000 volts right here. Not to mention we have mains voltage potential as well, which in your country up to 240 volts. That is super dangerous to work around. So only work inside a CRT if you know how to be safe. Do not do it otherwise because like I said, it can be very dangerous depending on what you're doing. All right, so I have the board removed from the set. This is the uh, Phillips board. Let's take a look at this on the bench. Well, looking at both of these boards side by side, they are so similar. In fact, uh, look at this, look at this chip here. This is the Phillips chip, and this is the Toshiba one that's uh, on the new board. I mean, the pin count is even the same. I wouldn't be surprised if like, you could take this chip and swap them around. They're probably identical. The biggest difference here is that obviously this one has an orientation that is this long way because the front input here, it only has a front input and the buttons are here and then the tuner is on the back. And on this one, obviously the orientation is, is turned sideways. But I mean, looking at the other parts here, switch mode power supply, switch mode power supply, the main microcontroller with the tuner, microcontroller with the tuner. We have the audio amplification part right here, which is this section on this board. And then vertical and horizontal deflection is right here. And on this board right here, it's in this area there. So yeah, super, super similar. Anyways, um, the biggest difference I'm noticing right off the bat that's gonna cause an issue is the connector for the CRT is different. Let's put these together. There it is. Uh, this is gonna be for, I think most larger CRTs have this connector and smaller ones have this one. Thing is, looking at the back, it appears this has both footprints. So I should be able just to remove this one from the Phillips board and remove this connector here and we'll swap these around. So let me do that quickly. Alrighty, there we go. So the connector is swapped over. Of course, the one thing you have to do is swap over these high voltage leads right here, but that's not a problem. With the old connector, you just sort of flip this open. There's a little uh, soldered connection in there, but in this one, it's actually a little bit better of a connector, so to speak. This whole part comes off, and then there's like a little press fit pin inside. You just release that. The original wire came out. This is from the other uh, CRT board. And then you just slide the new one in and it grabs it, and then you just clip it all back together. No problems there. The ground pin, which is right here, used to be over here. Um, so I had to move it over there because um, it's another ground lead there. This, this board is designed to have multiple connectors, as you can see there, sort of work on different CRTs. And uh, yeah, that should be it. Okay, we're one step closer to uh, having this thing working. All that's left is to hook up this, which is the deflection yoke cabling. I took a look at the schematic right here to figure out which are the two wires that go to vertical and which are the two that go to horizontal. The connector for the deflection is over here. I know you can't really see it because it's too small, but basically what I have determined is it's this red wire here and the blue wire that is the horizontal deflection and then the black and the white wire here are the vertical. Now, the interesting thing is you can see this connector here that has these pins. Uh, the way this is wired up on the board, this pin right here, this middle one where the red wire was connected is actually goes through and is connected to this pin on this connector. And that is uh, where this one was originally connected. And now there's just no pin installed in there. If this were on the board, it would be like that. So yeah, this uh, red wire would normally go right into that connector, but they connected it over here, which allows for some adjustability in the vertical. And the reason why that even allows for adjustability is because this pin and that pin goes into the flyback here and there's a couple extra windings which end up on these other pins right here. And if you move this red wire over to like say here, then some of the additional windings inside the flyback are actually in circuit with the vertical or horizontal deflection. This is what I think at least. So I made this little cheat sheet right here. So the original Phillips monitor, there was a green and a gray wire that's for the vertical. And now that is the black and the white wire. And then there are red and black on the original monitor. And that is now the red and the blue. And on the deflection yoke itself, which is where I'm gonna connect this wire harness to, I drew a little pin out just so I can remember if I need to put this monitor back to the way it was because this thing is not gonna work. <laughs> and this whole thing is a, a fool's errand. Let's hope that's not the case. So let me get this uh, wire here connected up. 
so we can give this thing a try. Alrighty, things are, well, they're looking good. So neck board is connected. High voltage lead is going to the CRT. There's no power to any of this. I have this uh, IEC jack connected to the power input. I ended up just uh, soldering on a couple wires there. Uh, let's see, we have the IR sensor here. I unplugged the extra front inputs. The buttons for the front are there. Speaker is actually connected. It's the same jack that works uh, for the board. Oh, and then the deflection yoke, that's, <laughs> that's what I was last working on. So here they are. They're just, um, I just sort of twisted the wires together, put some electrical tape on there. The reason why I did that is because I'm going to have to ensure that they're not hooked up backwards. If you have it hooked up backwards, as in the two wires flipped for the vertical or the horizontal, you're gonna get an image that's mirrored, either vertically, horizontally, or maybe both, if they're all four connected up wrong. But I am 99.999% sure that I have the vertical and the horizontal hooked up to the correct wires, just I don't know if the polarity is correct. And I put the um, that wire right here on the center pin, and I guess, um, I guess we're ready for testing. So I just need to get my step up transformer and a power cord hooked up to this. This does have an on off switch, which is handy. Okay, here we go. I'm, I can't say I am not a little bit nervous. For the first power on, I'm gonna be wearing these gloves and I'm actually gonna wear some safety goggles just in case things go terribly wrong. And I have a fire extinguisher just over there off camera. Yeah, I don't wanna, I don't wanna have anything be bad. I mean, things can happen, but you just never know. All righty. Well, here we go. Okay. Power is applied. Oh, the TV just turned itself on. <laughs> now I have the screen control turned all the way down. I'm going to take a look at the front. We definitely have high voltage. There should be no image because I, like I said, I turned the screen control all the way down. Let's see what we're getting from a high voltage perspective. Okay, we're getting 20,000 volts, which is basically exactly the same as what we were getting uh, with the original CRT there. All right, that is cool. Um, there's a little power LED that's lit up here on the, the remote board. I'm gonna grab a mirror so we can take a look at what's happening on the front. And there is the mirror and let's turn this back on. Okay, the set is running again. <laughs> Let us turn up the screen control on here. There's a freaking image and there's writing. <laughs> oh man, this freaking works. I can't even believe it. What? I figured there would be geometry problems, but so far, nope. And I'm just adjusting the focus control. <laughs> I can't even believe it. I can't even believe that this <laughs> is freaking working. Looks like, uh, I'm not sure if that's in focus. It appears to have some kind of, um, I don't know, like a Chinese symbol or something <laughs> on the <this> screen. <laughs> it freaking works. Well, I mean, we're not quite there yet, but, uh, <laughs> All right, I'm gonna grab some batteries to pop into the remote here, which incidentally weighs like two grams. <laughs> okay, batteries are in the remote. Let's see if I can turn the set off. Oh, <laughs> yep, that turned off. <laughs> Press the power button on the remote and it did power on. I can hear it, look at that, <laughs> look at that. All right, so it is running in uh, 50 Hertz. That is why, um, you know, that we have that camera issue. Let's see if we can get a test signal into this thing. There's an AV button here. So I don't know what that's doing exactly. Oh, it's okay. I can see the writing is upside down. <laughs> there it is. There's an NTSC signal. The color looks terrible, but um, the image looks really good. It's just rotated 180 degrees. So let me fix those, uh, those deflection yoke wires um, <laughs> down in here that I was talking about. Let me properly shut the set off first. There it is. And then we'll kill the main power to it. All right, I fixed the wires, no more electrical tape. I actually shrink wrapped, well, soldered the wires and then shrink wrapped them. So let's do a little more testing. All right, we're ready for liftoff. Let's power this thing up. 
I know for sure the image looks right. There it is. There we go. I swapped the input to something that's a little less uh, bright. It's a crosshatch pattern. And uh, yeah, it's looking fine. The geometry, uh, it's not perfect. There's some linearity issues, but we're gonna have to try to figure out how to get to the service mode to fix that. Notice these boxes down here are closer together than the ones up here. The TV with the original board didn't have that issue. So that's a, a side effect of this. All right, I switched to this solid gray background. Let's go into the menu. All right, so obviously um, this is gonna be picture controls, has a picture of a face. So it looks like the uh, image goes off the bottom a little bit. I can see there's one more line that's just slightly hidden there. This is probably like brightness can contrast, things like that. If we push menu, okay, so we have a clock stuff. I uh, skipped over that, which will be the tuner stuff. Okay, this is a uh, like sort of tools. I bet you this first one here is language. Oh, French. Okay. Oh, whoa. Uh, Russian. Hmm. Is this Turkish? Ah, uh, Arabic. So it's got way more languages than it said it had. Um, oh wait, you know what? Uh, this is maybe not Arabic or maybe there are two different types of Arabic, like Farsi and something like that. Okay. Uh, Indonesian there and Thai. So there's Thai and there we go. English. Cool. So we got calendar game. I wonder what that is. Background probably has the blue background on or off. Curtain, that's probably that effect when you turn the picture off and on, it had that um, kind of a closing effect. And something off the bottom, which we can't read. <laughs> uh, we have volume. I had turned that down a second ago because with that crosshatch pattern, I heard a little buzzing through the speaker. And yeah, contrast, okay, just like I thought. Now with tint is visible because it's hooked up to NTSC right now. NTSC is the only one that has that, and POW obviously doesn't have that. Sharpness and something else on the bottom again, we cannot read. Uh, we got simple clock features. I guess it's been plugged in for four minutes. And there we go. Okay, um, let's see, what's calendar? Whoa, an actual calendar. <laughs> Wait, July 2023? That was last month. <laughs> How does it have the date? Uh, that went away. Oops, let's just get back to where we were. So calendar, and you can move through the months. <laughs> what a funny feature. All right, let's go back. Uh, game. Oops, that was the wrong button. So you got to push down, and then you have to push to the right. Game. What? <laughs> Wait, <laughs> this is some kind of game. <laughs> Wait, what? what is it? I don't even... Oh, this is... Wait a second. No way. You have to push these boxes to pick up all the things. And then I guess we finished the level because now we can push up or down. So let's try level three. Oh, no freaking way. Okay, so I've played these types of games before. So we have to get these boxes on top of the little fruits there. Um, but to do that, we're going to have to go down here. And uh, up, over, oh no, I think I've already ruined this. I think I have already ruined this because the problem is if I'm trying to try to go up to get over to this area, I can't now because that box is there and you can't pull it back. You can only move it <laughs> up or down. <laughs> this is actually not bad, you know? <laughs> a built-in game in a television? <laughs> I have never, ever seen anything like this. This is freaking awesome. I freaking love this. Oh, pushing the menu button, uh, reset the level. What else do we have on this remote? Anything else interesting here? Okay, that's the game button that goes directly to it. Uh, let's see what else. This button here doesn't seem to do anything, nor does this button. The menu button's in the middle. Uh, this one says sis. Oh, hey. Look at this, PAL, CCAM, NTSC 4.43, and NTSC 3.54. This thing is truly multi-standard, and that would make it my only multi-standard TV that I have. So here we go. PAL, obviously we have no color decoding, and now I have a, a PAL signal generator over here, so we'll test that out in a second. CCAM, obviously not gonna work, 443, and there it is, NTSC. Wow, I am really impressed. That is awesome. Uh, looks like we have a sleep timer. Yeah, big whoop, but there we go. Um, oh, okay, so this button, 
I think what it does is it turns off the picture for audio only. So therefore, if you want to just listen to the sound but not have a bright image, say at night, you can do that. Although it's not like it turns off the CRT. It'd be nice if it actually shut the CRT off. That is not the case. All right, that turns it back on. Oh, there's some kind of um, aspect ratio control, 16 by nine and four by three. Although clearly that's not working because it's um, hardly having any effect on the zoom there. Uh, oh, okay, this is like picture modes. I had it on personal. And this is display. All right. Top right button here has to do with inputs. So we are running in 50 Hertz there, which is why it's flickering, but this obviously is like the tuner. All right, I adjusted the shutter speed down to 50 Hertz. Let's get this thing to stop focus hunting. There we go, hopefully that works. So yeah, there we go, 50 Hertz, and um, that's the uh, no image screen or no signal screen. Pushing up or down though, um, yeah, there we go. Uh, oh, what, Ccam BG? I mean, are these have to do with channel channels that are available or something? I don't, I don't, I don't really know, DK? I'm pushing the down button here on the remote. I just swapped over to the PAL signal generator here. So let's see what that does. Uh, there we go. Yep, it's nice and flickery to my eyes, but to the camera it shouldn't be. That is PAL right there. I'm not particularly sure why my Tektronix signal generator doesn't have a better color bar than this, like one that takes up the whole screen. It always has this like split red, which is weird. But either way, um, it definitely looks really good clear and sharp without any issue. Let's go to the menu here. And oh, hey, look, we can now look at the bottom line because uh, I guess in PAL, there's you know more lines. So it's actually squished the image a little bit, although it's now off the top of the screen. So what we couldn't see before was the temperature. And we also don't have the tint anymore, which you, you might understand is normal. And then we have a timer. What we couldn't see before is position. And then for the settings here, we have noise reduction on or off. I wonder what that does exactly. Don't really notice any particular difference there. And then we have volume. So yeah, is as expected, but okay. So I'm right away super excited. I mean, this is obviously a given, but this thing is totally multi format. And this original TV, this Philips TV originally, it could only display NTSC. And if you put a PAL signal into it, you got black and white. You would not get any color decoding, even though it wouldn't roll, the image was stable. Yeah, it didn't really work properly. So this is a huge, huge improvement over what we had before. There's that pattern. Um, yeah, so, okay, well, next thing is I need to figure out how to get into the service menu on this thing. The linearity also doesn't look super great here in PAL mode. Let's see about the zoom button. Does zoom do, doesn't really do that much either in PAL. So looking at the remote here, it appears that there's maybe a little button right there that you have to push with a paper clip. It's like a secret button. And that might be the service button for this set. Okay, I flipped the TV around so I can more easily look at it. The focus is locked. And let's see if this is actual button. Oh, whoa, hey, look at that. <laughs> that freaking works. So red cut, green cut, blue cut, green drive, blue drive. Um, these are some blanking settings here. Let's uh, figure out how to uh, use this menu, I guess. I need to see how this, how the interface works here. Okay, I can push down to go down here. Okay, interesting how it darkens it when you go down there. Um, maybe this has something to do with the color balance down here. I'm not sure. All right, so that just loops around. I'm not gonna adjust any of this. I'm looking for geometry settings. I'm gonna push this button again. Doesn't seem, oh wait, there we go. I pushed it properly. So we got phase. So this is gonna be moving the picture left and right. I should bring up the geometry on here. Okay, there we go. So we got vertical size. We need to shrink this. This is, oh yeah, look at this. Whoa, NTSC at the top there. Uh, vertical position. Oh, I see. So look at that. It actually doesn't move the, the on-screen display. It's only moving the actual image behind it. Linearity. Ah, there it is. Linearity. That's what we needed to fix right there. So we're trying to get these boxes here to be all the same size, essentially. Vertical SC. I don't know what this is. 
Oh, I think this uh, shrinks the top and the bottom specifically without affecting the, the, uh, the middle that much. So you have to use this and the linearity control just to kind of get it all adjusted as correct as possible. All right, so besides the horizontal phase, we have this one, H-Bow, which probably adjusts the top and the bottom, and it does. It um, knows how it's bowed out right here. Let's see if we can get this dialed in better. Looks like seven is the best possible setting. Doesn't get any better than that. Uh, parabola, this is gonna tilt the whole image this way. So let's see if what's best. I don't know, whatever. Um, this probably blanks the top and the bottom of the image to help if you have rollover. So if you see some bits of the image that are being drawn on there, you can probably blank it. Now we're not seeing it, but I bet you it's blanking the top and the bottom here. So we're gonna leave that maxed out. Oh yeah, see, there we go, we can see it. See this white line down here? Notice it's gone there. And I'm gonna adjust the face here. You're looking at these color bars just because I'm used to them. Um, there's no horizontal size control that I've seen so far. I'd like to bring that in if possible, but that might not be possible. So we're just gonna try to balance the amount we're gonna see uh, these color bars on the edge, but definitely a lot of it cropped off the edges. Incidentally, if you're noticing a little bit of color distortion up here, that's because I have the degaussing coil disconnected. The coil on this TV is almost certainly designed for 120 volts, and currently this TV is running off 240 volts. So you do not want to connect that up, otherwise it will probably burn that coil out. If the power supply works on 120, we'll test that later, then I can plug it back in, or I might have to convert the power supply over to 120, and then I can still plug it back in, either way. I'm in the menu, incidentally, it says factory down here. So you can still access the menu, which is kind of cool. Oh, look at that, it's flickering. Um, but yeah. All right, let's push this little button again, see if there's another page. Oh, there is not. We are just back at this screen right here. Let's go back and forth here. Uh, yeah, but just appears to be two things. So you push it once, it says factory at the top, push it again, we got the color drive and stuff like that. <clears throat> Let's see what this blanking does here. Nothing obvious. And without the color displayed, um, we're losing out on this stuff. Let's bring the color bars back. So what do these do? Eight, nine. I'm not immediately seeing what these controls do. If you have any ideas, definitely let me know. Same with these two, these black or blanking controls. Could have something to do with the black level maybe. Let's see if that's changing anything obvious. Nothing that I can see at least. Now, I just had a thought. Remember I was talking about how vertically this seems to be a little bit too much of a stretch. I wonder if moving that that connector for the vertical deflection where it's plugged into the board there, if that will change this. So let's power off the set here and let's move that wire over and let's just see um, what kind of an effect that has. All right, so I just moved it one step towards the back of the set. Let's power on the set. We have the power LED there. Let's see if this is still working or what's happening. Oh, hey, we're still working. Oh yeah, that brought the image in quite a bit. Notice how much more we're seeing now. All right, so that's good to know. So just moving that connection around changes that up. Okay, well, let's go back into the uh, service menu there, factory. Oh yeah, look, now we're seeing way more of this over on the side. We don't need anything in this menu here. So phase, um, yeah, we can adjust this. Oh yeah, now we have way more control available here. Still sort of shifted over. Well, I have to keep this all the way over to that side to even have it centered at all, but now it's not bad. Now the service menu here, it says NTSC at the top here, and I don't know, F1 maybe or whatever it says. So probably all of these geometry settings are only gonna have effect in NTSC. Therefore, I need to connect a power source um, with the other generator there and do this again. All right, there we go. I know it's rolling, but um, I think this is adjusted you know, pretty good for PAL. All right, here we are. I have a Commodore 64 connected up to the TV. I have it hooked up through RF here. I went and found the cable. And let's turn this on. There it is, freaking works. And we should have sound as well if we go to 8-Bit Dance Party here. Let's turn the volume up. There it is. It freaking works. <laughs> Now, if we go into the menu here, we go into the satellite dish, I had to go in here 
and set this to auto-tune. So once the computer was plugged in, it took several minutes to basically find whatever channel um, the, this uh, machine or whatever frequency this computer is broadcasting on, and then it has saved it into here. There are different bands available, UHF, VHF, low and high. And maybe if I bring the menu back. Uh, MFT is manual fine tuning. You can um, fine tune the image or you know the signal that is. Uh, search and auto tune, I don't know quite the difference between search and auto tune. And if we move down to the next page here, current position, that's like the preset number, it's saved into this preset zero. Looks like you can um, copy that to a different preset. Confirm, uh, you can skip, so you can skip channels, I guess. And then uh, sound has three options, B, G, I, and D, K. My assumption is if we go in and we do the date 8 -bit dance party, I think we will have no sound now. Ah, uh, yes, we have static. So there must be some kind of difference between the different sound systems, depending on what country you're in. So there's sound on BG. LI gives no sound, just static, and DK as well. It seems like the TV automatically set that up when the thing did the auto scan. Looking at the back of the set again, I just wanted to kind of go over how this thing is currently set up. So 220 volts are coming in from my step up transformer through this little block here. I just have it soldered directly onto the power pins there. The high voltage lead is going to the CRT. We have um, the screen voltages right here. One is screen, one is focus voltage that goes to the neck board. Of course, I swapped over that, that little connector here. And then this right here are the deflection yoke winding cables. So I went ahead and soldered those on. And remember, I ended up moving this little red connector right here towards one pin towards the back of the set. And that was to shrink the picture horizontally. It was basically too stretched in the middle section uh, position, but set one position towards the back, fix the geometry issue there. Now, one of the main problems with running this thing long term is obviously this doesn't really work inside the TV set here. Uh, their speaker is sort of in the way, not to mention I can't even move this all the way to the front of the set because of the, you know, the components that are on the front of the PCB here. They just don't work. The speaker on the TV is up here in the front and with it there, I can't really move this in all the way. So it's possible I could like kind of make this thing sort of work somehow but I'm not sure that the back cover would go on, not without having to like dremel a large portion of it away to allow this thing to fit in here. Well, I did a little uh, digging around with these vice grips here, and I think I'm gonna try to dremel away as much plastic as possible in, in the case here, and then see how well this thing can fit inside of here. I would like to try to get the back cover on, even if this thing is just sort of sitting in there with some hot glue and whatnot. And I think with the speaker out, I think it might be possible. All right, I ground away a lot of the plastic on the bottom here and I think it's gonna work. And I actually fed the uh, various things through the front panel, like the buttons and stuff like that. I'll just hot glue them on. And on the back cover here, I ground away a big chunk right here. So they should have access to the uh, video connector and the RF connection, stuff like that. And then on the board itself, when it comes to the power supply, I went ahead and I removed that one loose cap. I installed two capacitors in place of the one. And that allows you to basically convert a 220 volt power supply to operate on 120 volts. And when you have these two caps in series, like they are here, you run a connection from in between the two caps down to the bridge rectifier. And that's this red wire right here. When we look at the schematics right here, that's the original single cap, which gets its negative and its positive from the output of the bridge rectifier. Well, we have two caps in series now, and uh, the positive and the negative is hooked up in the same place this cap was. But then in between those two caps, I ran a wire over to this side of the bridge rectifier on the AC side. Well, I'm not gonna explain exactly how this works, but it essentially boosts the voltage that's in the DC cap right here. And then that allows the power supply to see the same voltage it would, whether it's on 240 volts or 120 volts. Of course, if you connected this power supply back to 240 volts with this little mod done to it, then it would damage the power supply because it would be doubling the voltage and those caps would see far too high of a voltage. Now I will add, I haven't tested this little setup like this, so hopefully it does work and doesn't cause any issues. I didn't even test this power supply on 120 volts directly without this little mod here. I just figure this thing is designed for 240 volts and yeah, it's not gonna work properly on 120 volts and I don't wanna risk even damaging it. 
And this is how it looks. The board is just sort of sitting in there. There was a plastic frame on the bottom if I had to take that out so it fits in here. And in fact, uh, the capacitors now, the two that I just put in, fit a bit better. The original one was a bit tall and it kind of wedged up against the bottom of the CRT. I think I have everything connected up for doing some rudimentary testing. If we turn this around, you can see here that the uh, IR sensor, the buttons, and the front AV inputs are all there. I'm just gonna hot glue them on the front of this set if it does work. Speaker's not currently connected because it doesn't really fit. Although I think it can be made to fit <laughs> with a little hot glue. I'll just sort of stick it uh, facing up. Uh, so basically it originally faced down and sent sound out the front of the set. If I face it up here, there'll just be sound inside the TV. It won't be ideal, but you know, <laughs> uh, if I wanted to have better sound, I'd hook up speakers. And obviously I have a regular US type power cord connected up. This is the original one that was on this set. There's a little bit of strain relief right there when the cover's on, holds it in place. Yeah, um, okay. I think we're good for testing now. Okay, isolation transformers here. I have the little uh, switch thing plugged into it. It's currently in the off position. Let's plug this into here. And uh, when I turn that on, it's gonna be the moment of truth for this set. Let's get this in focus, there we go. So this is the area right here you need to watch for if something goes catastrophically wrong. I hope it does not go catastrophically wrong, but here we go. Okay. I can see the power LED is turned on on the IR thing. Oh, okay. The set is powered up and it's running right now. <laughs> and you can see the glow of the set <laughs> working. Oh boy, so that worked. That little conversion actually worked. So this thing is now working at 120 volts. Gotta say, it looks a little bright. I wonder if that is the uh, screen control that maybe is turned up too high. Let's power this off. I'm looking at the schematic here and the set runs on a B plus of 110 volts and there is an adjustable potentiometer for that. I should try to find a little test point on here somewhere. See if I can measure that voltage. Where can I pick up 110 volts? There's 180 boost. Looks like on the flyback transformer, 110 volts B plus is found on pin four. I think that's pin four. All right, there we go. B plus is currently running at 110 volts. According to the schematic here, what did I just say it was supposed to run at? 110 volts plus 110 volts. Okay, so that looks good. I wonder why this looks a bit brighter than it should. I am, and I am thinking that this is a screen setting entirely which is the lower one right here. I might have easily just bumped this. Oh yeah, that's that's exactly what it was. I must have bumped it while I was working on the board. What I need to do is get this thing dialed in and then put a little bit of um, hot glue on the flyback there. That way it kind of locks it in place right here. I hooked up the degaussing coil right there. Now that this thing is running off 120 volts, that is safe to do. Definitely not safe to do <laughs> the way it was running. Uh, 220 volts, this uh, degaussing coil right here definitely would just burn up instantly. It uh, is not designed to work on 220 volts. And now when I hit the power switch here, I should hear that degaussing sound. I don't know, I didn't really hear anything, but I'm assuming that works. There's probably some kind of like a thermistor or something like that. Oh, the set's on already. Let's turn this around. All righty, with the set turned around, you know what, I'm, it's looking pretty bright. Now I wonder, um, there's a little bit of weird distortion going on right here in the corner. Is that this transformer? Let's move that down. Nope, it's still doing it. I wonder if that is the deflection, or not the deflection yoke, the, um, if that's the degaussing coil, let's turn that off. Let me unplug the degaussing coil here. 
My thought here is that the degaussing circuit is designed for 220 volts, and at 120 volts, it never actually de-energizes the coil entirely. So I'll turn this back on with it unplugged. Let's see what we get. I might need to just put a toggle switch. Yeah, that's definitely it because there was this sort of uh, distortion happening up in the corner. That's not happening now. What's interesting as well is since taking this thing apart and putting it back together, the picture shifted over to the side. And that's after I did all my calibration. So I wonder what the deal is with that. There's also a little bit of that color distortion still happening up here in the top corner. Could well be, let's just switch to a full field. There's a little bit there. It could be that um, the deflection yoke is in the wrong position. I did take this thing apart and put it back together entirely. So it's quite possible I got to fix that. Anyways, I, that's not a problem with the actual board that's in here. That is definitely a physical deflection yoke thing, which should be able to fix. Okay, so front inputs work, that's cool. And when we unplug it, it just goes away. All right, it's time to let the hot glue gun warm up. And I'm gonna attach these little controls and things to the front case. This TV is gonna be extremely janky, just mega jank, all of it. Alrighty, there it is. The set is, uh, well, <laughs> looking a lot better actually than I thought it would. So all of this stuff is actually hot glued onto the front. So it actually works. Like you can uh, change the volume and change the input here. You can bring up the menu, stuff like that. So that works as expected. And then take a look, the cover's on too. <laughs> well, there we go. The Janktastic Picture Master HD multifunction, this, that, and the other thing is <laughs> it's in this set. It's janky, but it works. And it's by far my best multi-format display that I have. Ccam, PAL, a couple different types of NTSC, and it just works. And that PAL image is bright and vibrant. That's a lot better than, well, the only other PAL CRT that I have is my Sony broadcast monitor that's back there. And to be honest, that thing is a pretty poor PAL monitor. And that's because that monitor does not do color averaging from one scan line to another, unlike this one, which means on a lot of things like the Commodore 64, you get these bars when you have a solid color, you get these alternating color bars where it's slightly more blue, less blue, more blue, less blue. I think they're called Hanover bars. And that comes from the fact that with PAL color, you have to do chroma averaging across scan lines. And the Sony PVM does not do that. This, on the other hand, does. So it looks, well, frankly, amazing, even hooked up to that Commodore 64. And better yet, of course, it has an RF tuner, something that I've never had before. So now I can actually hook up these imported computers to this thing and get an image, get an actual image. That alone is worth the price of admission. And I think that the $47 that I spent on this thing was money well spent. The one thing about this, whole TV set is it's incredibly ugly. It was already ugly enough before I did this jank on the front here, but this bulbous front, it's just, it doesn't look good at all. Even if this thing were just in a solid wooden box with this board here mounted in the bottom and uh, you know some of this stuff here available on the front and then the CRT just poking through the wood, that would look a whole lot better. Unfortunately, I have like zero woodworking skills. So that's probably not something that's gonna happen. And um, well, it's probably gonna live its life in this ugly CRT case here. <laughs> Anyhow, if you're feeling adventurous and you kind of know what you're doing with CRTs a little bit, then something like this might be a fun project. Grab an old 20 inch or 13 inch or 14 inch or whatever CRT, get this thing bodged into the case and make yourself a freaking kick-ass multi-function monitor. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. Um, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Uh, put comments down below if you have any thoughts or whatever about this particular video. I am gonna put links to the schematic, which I've scanned down below, plus um, the side of this box here if you wanna read the specs and stuff like that. I'll put a link to where I got this, but to be honest, those links on AliExpress don't last very long. So just do a search for, I don't know, I'll put a little search term in the description below so you can try to find your own. 
I want to thank my patrons. Their names are going to scroll up the side of the screen. They make all of this possible. They get early access to videos and things like that. So if you want to become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. I guess that's going to be that. Um, I'm definitely running out of breath. Human malware took a lot out of me and I seem to be sweating a lot more than I used to, even though I don't have a fever or anything like that. I don't know what's going on with that. Anyways, that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.